this presentation, we will record the allowance for doubtful accounts and the bad debt expense for a time period using the allowance method. There are two methods we can use to record the allowance for doubtful accounts and the bad debt expense under the allowance method. So in other words, there's two methods for writing off the bad debt, the allowance method and the uh, direct write-off method. We are using the allowance method and now determining what the bad debt expense is or should be as well as the allowance for doubtful accounts with an estimate. There are two methods we could use under the allowance method to calculate this estimate. We could focus on the balance sheet or we could focus on the income statement and they're both relevant to look at. The more common method probably is to focus on the balance sheet and let the income statement kind of fall out where it may. A few different reasons for that. One is that we typically oftentimes concentrate on, on the balance sheet that way and, and try to tie out all the balance sheet accounts and then let the income statement, which will be the other side of the entry, which will be a credit uh, to the allowance and a debit to bad debt expense, be what it needs to be. And then the income statement will roll over. Part of the reason for this is the income statement will then roll over to um, the capital account and we'll be able to start over again whereas the balance sheet is a permanent account so if we make it correct it should be better in the long run possibly so that okay, one argument for <laughs> focusing on the balance sheet method too if you look at a book problem the balance sheet method is a bit more complicated because we're, we have to break out a, um, an aging as we'll do here typically and we also need to consider the fact that we already probably have something in the allowance due to the estimate from the last time period not being exact, which it never will be, and therefore we need some subtraction problem uh, rather than just recording the result we get when doing the calculation. So for that reason, allowance method's a bit more complex and therefore uh, more favored for test type questions because there's different questions that we could ask about it. Uh, but just recognize that uh, the the problem on the balance sheet side is that we have these accounts receivable uh, that represents money that is owed to us by customers. We need to know that, creditors want to know that number, but we recognize that too it could be overstated given the fact that we know that probably some of those customers aren't going to pay us, that's just how business works. So we're gonna, we can't write off anything directly to the receivable account here because we don't know who's going to pay us, but we could probably make an estimate about around how much we think is not going to be paid based on industry standards and that's what we'll talk about now rather than writing down the receivable directly which we can't do because we don't know who's not going to pay us and therefore we can't really track it in the subsidiary ledger down here based on who's not going to pay us and we could also tell our reader more by making a contra asset account meaning rather than just netting it out here we could tell our reader this way hey this is how much is actually owed to us this is how much we think is uncollectible. It's just an estimate, however. And if you subtract the two, then that will give you the net receivable we, exact, we actually believe we're going to get paid. Now we're going to focus on making this number right, this balance sheet side, but there is a problem on the, uh, the income statement side as well, meaning we have this revenue that we generated here, and we probably are, are aware that any revenue we generated on account, some percentage of it will be uncollectible. And so we also want to record the other side of it, which we'll do as we focus on the balance sheet, we'll focus the other side will be bad debt expense, which hopefully will do a good representation of matching up the revenue that will not be uh, collectible in the form of bad debt. So we'll match up revenue in the same time period that the bad debt uh, will be expensed and will reduce net income in the proper time period by doing that. Now the, the other method, the percentage of sales method, would focus more on making the income statement correct. Uh, here we're focusing in, and then it would let, the, it would let the, the allowance account, the balance sheet side, just fall and be where it may. So we would focus on the income statement, the net income being correct, and let the balance sheet uh, hopefully work itself out. Here we're focusing on the balance sheet and hopefully the income statement will kind of work itself out by being the other side of the transaction. So uh, let's do that now. So if we do, the, if we do the, this method, what we're going to do is we're going to take this accounts receivable, one typical way of doing this, and break out some type of aging. So here's our 1,146,300. 
we're going to break that out into some type of aging. Now this is going to be a bit of an arbitrary breakout. I'm just going to put some numbers in here. We would obviously have to, uh, if we had software, the software would easily be able to break out how past due our debt is. So if we say that it's, it's within 30 days uh, that's due, I'm just going to bring out a number 170, 1040, uh, 91740. And then we're going to say that it's 30 to 90 days uh, uh, in the due period, 141,945. And then 60, I'm sorry, 30 to 60. And then 60 to 90. So that's 34389. Again, I'm just kind of making up these numbers as if you know we ran a report. And this is the total accumulation of the accounts receivable that falls into these periods of uh, dueness within 30 days, 30 to 60 days, 60 to 90 days, and then over 90 days, which is, I'm going to say, uh, 22925. And the point is that this should all sum up to the uh, balance that we just looked at on the, um, the subsidiary ledger. This needs to be this is six. Okay, and then we're going to sum this up and sum this up and that gives us our 1,146,300. Uh, Once again, if I'm just going to scroll back over to the trial balance just to show that should be the amount there, 1,146,300. That's the amount on the general ledger, 1,146,300. We're basically just breaking up that information rather than just by date but by grouping of past due amounts. The reason being is that we're going to be able to estimate or we're going to try to estimate that if something's more overdue, we're not going to try to make judgments about particular clients and see if they're not going to pay us. We're going to try to make judgments based on how past due something is and industry standards to see if what percentage is not going to get paid based on that. So if it's, if it's within 30 days, we're going to say that 2% is not going to get paid. Where did we come up with that? We just, based on industry standards and past experience, it's an estimate. That's our best guess. And then on uh, 30 to 60, we're going to say 4%, just an estimate. These are not going to be exact. These, this is our best guess to try to tell the reader to the financial statements how much of this amount is not going to be collectible. Uh, 60 to 90, we're going to say, what, 10%. Notice as we get older, it's less likely that we're going to collect on it because we've been trying to collect on it, in this case, for 90 days. Haven't been able to. Therefore, we're going to say it's very unlikely once it gets to that period that we are not going to collect on it. So of these amounts, these are the percentages we think are uncollectible. If we multiply them out, this equals the 91740 times the 2%. This one equals the uh, 171945 times the 4%. And yeah, we could, uh, of course, uh, copy this across the formula and it would work autofill it. But we're just going to do the calculations to note what we're doing. This is going to be the 34,389 times the 10%. And this is going to be equal to the 22,926 times the 95%. And this, of course, is summing this up. So if we add this, 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 adds up to 50,437. So in essence, we're saying this matches our total receivables, what is owed to us. This is how much of those total receivables we believe is uncollectible, 50,437. Now, um, we, that's gonna be what we're gonna adjust our allowance account to be. Now, if we scroll back over, um, you'd think that would just be it and we can record our journal entry, but there's one last step that often messes people up and it often messes people up because we're not given the trial balance when we work these problems. So um, if we were, we would say, okay, there's the 15,300, here's our accounts receivable. We've determined that 50,437 is not collectible. So we need to make this account 50,437. But there's 15,300 in there already. Why? Because it's in there from the last time period estimate that wasn't exact, it's left over. Now, it's usually going to be a credit because it's, it's usually, you know, possibly our, our estimate was higher than was actually uncollectible. But if it was a debit, then, um, you know, we'd have to do an addition problem to do the calculation. So in other words, our calculation, we need to make this number 50,437 in the credit direction because it needs to be a contra asset, the opposite of this number. 
So we need to make it go up in the credit direction. We need to credit it by the difference, 50,437 minus 15,300. That would be a credit of only the 35,137 to get us to 50,347. Now, if this were a debit, just recognize if that was a debit, meaning uh, we, we underestimated uh, in the prior time period, we'd have to get to a 50,433 credit, which means we'd have to debit it 15,300 just to get it back to zero. We'd have to credit it 15,300 to get it back to zero plus another 50,437 or 65,737. So that's a possible scenario as well. Ours has a credit balance. So we're going to take the 50,437 minus 15,300. That's the amount we're going to be uh, making a journal entry for. It's going to be crediting this account and debiting the bad debt expense. So let's do that. We're going to do that down here. We're going to debit bad debt expense. We're going to put a cursor on K11, right click and copy. Put that here in B21, right click and paste. One, two, three. I'm going to do that calculation one more time because it's good times. We're going to say this equals and we will say the 50,437 we want it to be minus what's there, which is 15,300, gives us that 35,137. We need to have it uh, bring it up. Then we're going to put the credit, which I'm going to use with our negative plug formula, which will be negative of that number. So there is our credit, and that will be going to the allowance for doubtful accounts. It has a credit balance. We're going to increase it by doing the same thing to it. Another credit. So we're going to copy K7, right click and copy, bring that down, put that in B22, right click and paste, one, two, three. There's our journal entry. Let's record it out, see if it does what we want it to do. What do we want it to do? We want it to make this number what we think it should be, 50,437. So first bad debt, here it is. Here it is on the trial balance, second to last account. It's in order, assets, liabilities, equity, income, and expense. Here's the, it's going to be in the same order on the general ledger over here. So here's our assets, liabilities, equity, revenue, and expense. Here's the bad debt expense in Z9. We're in Z9. Z9 equals, scrolling back over, we're going to pick up that 35,137, bringing the balance up from zero by 35,137 to 35,137. That 35,137 also appearing on the trial balance, bringing down net income and taking us out of balance by 35,137. We're then going to record the allowance for doubtful accounts. Here it is on the journal entry. Here it is on the trial balance, third account on the trial balance, and therefore third account on the general ledger. We're going to scroll down here. We have the open account on S13. S13. We're going to say that equals and scroll back over and scroll back down. We're going to pick up that 35,137 credit and enter. And that brings the balance from 15,300 up by 35,137 to 50,437. That being what we want it to be, this 50,437. I'm going to scroll back over. Sorry, scrolling back and forth a little quickly. I'm going to scroll back over to the trial balance here. So here's the 50,437 there, puts us back in balance here. So now our allowance for doubtful accounts is the, I mean, our accounts receivable is 1,146,300. Our allowance is what we calculated it to be, 50,437. The difference between the due, the debit minus the credit, 1,095,863 represents the net amount that we actually expect to receive. This amount of the receivable is supported, backed up by the subsidiary ledger. This amount is not because it's just an estimate. The bad debt expense then falls out to do what it, what it, um, to decrease the net income. So it's revenue minus the expenses, which should align with the matching principle because hopefully this number represents the amount of sales here that we believe to be uncollectible and therefore the difference between the two gives us our net income, which we hope is in alignment with the matching principle.